So what's the whole point of this? Why do we even engage in wildfire behavior science? The first thing is training and education. We want firefighters and, and other personnel to be safe and to understand how to interpret what they see when they're out there on the fire line. And so the best way to do that is to offer real, concrete, physical explanations for fire behavior. The second is for planning and mitigation. So we know we're going to have fires, but what we clearly don't want is fire disasters. We don't want a lot of negative impacts from them. And there's ways to mitigate fire behavior and fire impacts on ecology or on structures, things like that. In order to do that, you have to understand how fire behaves. Prediction, most people think prediction is like the main point of what we're doing, but in actuality it's probably third because we really don't have that many fires compared to the number of um, planning uh, in, in mitigation kinds of activities as well as training activities. So prediction, we want good operational models. We want to predict where the fires are going to go and, and how fast for large fires um, uh, the, in, in the U.S. can go on for weeks and for months. Um, so it's really, prediction is an important part of this. And lastly, there's a lot of ecological modeling that goes on where fire is a component of the ecosystems. We need to have good physical representations of how fire behaves there. So because of all these different needs for fire, uh, behavior, science, and programs, and, and applications, there are a lot of systems that have been developed. These are just some logos from most of the systems in the United States. So models, tools, maps, data, all this stuff. But what those systems incorporate are operational models of fire behavior. And pretty much for the last 50 years, uh, major uh, areas with fire management issues, such as Australia, Canada, the US, um, have developed independently different kinds of operational models. Um, these are exclusively empirical, meaning that data have been collected and curves fit through those data without really explaining how things happen. And so all of our, these countries, um, and, and a lot more too, are dependent on these empirical kinds of models, um, primarily designed to estimate fire spread rate spread rate has a lot of <coughs> really useful uh, uh, implications for fire management, right? So if you know how fast a fire is spreading, you can calculate how long it'll take you to get to the fire and be able to suppress it at a given size, things like that. Um, so different ways of approaching the empirical modeling, field empirical, uh, such as Canadian Australian systems, you go out and burn a bunch of things under different conditions, develop a rate of spread uh, for those conditions and start uh, fitting curves and different kinds of models. Uh, there's a different empirical approach in the Missoula lab. Um, we come at it from a laboratory standpoint where we develop these um, <coughs> uh, uh, data sets from laboratory burns in the wind tunnel or in the, wind ch in the burn chamber and do a number of curve fits and other kinds of, of modeling. And they all have their pluses and minuses. Field empirical, they're directly applicable at the scale you collect the data. You know you're not getting kinds of extrapolations when you start to use them at the field scale. There, however, there's poor control over the variables, the wind, the moisture content, the fuel patchiness. You can't control all that stuff. Okay, so there's a lot of ambiguity. Laboratory, we have pretty good control over the variables in the laboratory, but we have to make assumptions about the applicability at field scale where we really want to apply it. Okay, so, um, there's a lot of limits of these models. These models don't do very much, really, um, with respect to explaining anything. We can't do thresholds, whether fire spread or not, cannot be predicted here. Can't deal with discontinuous fuels, live fuels, um, non-heading, that is backing or flanking, non-steady wind, and a host of other kinds of things. Um, we also can't very easily uh, in integrate these models in, into atmospheric uh, models so you can get fire and atmosphere kinds of coupling because most of these models develop with the uh, explicit assumption of absence of any coupling. Okay, so 50 years. Why don't we have any replacements for these models? Why are we still using models developed in the 1950s and 60s and 70s? Well, it's <clears throat> a good answer for that. Um, this was a review by Andrew Sullivan, an Australian uh, fire researcher. He looked at 19 different models, and there's a lot more than that, but he looked at 19 models that claim to be physical or quasi-physical, and this pithy quote from this kind of explains it all to me. Identification and formulation of the processes involved in the behavior of wildland fire is problematic. We can't identify or formulate the processes involved. How can we have a physical model? You know, you could, you could say it even more pithily. You could say, we don't know how fire spreads, and we'd be right. Okay, uh, all of these models formulate them a little bit differently and make different kinds of assumptions. 
Uh, here's a, a quote from a paper by Terry Clark and others. Um, Science of wildfires in its infancy. Um, numerical models, uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, fluid dynamics models are necessary. They face an enormous task of treating a physical problem where the relevant spatial scales are six to seven orders of magnitude. So the scales from the finest scale of particle, individual pine needles or grass stems igniting and heating and the time and space scales associated with that all the way up to many dozens of kilometers of the field scale. That's what causes the problem. You can't boost brute force this. You can't simply make a model with a mesh size of submillimeter and then have it expand all the way out to many tens of kilometers. Okay. Um, so we want to know very much how fast fire spread, the effect of wind on fire spread, the effect of slope, the effect of fire on fire spread. But we can't just get there directly, not if we're going to try to develop this physical approach. We need to first step back and say, well, how do they spread? This is something that we haven't done as a, as a community worldwide. We really haven't spent the time uh, uh, investigating how things happen and when, they, when does fire spread and when doesn't it spread. We've jumped straight to the operational kinds of questions and tried to answer how fast do they go. So now we have to step back. If we want to develop the real physics here, we need to step back and ask these questions. It's a very strongly coupled system that consists of a pretty simple uh, um, diagram here. You have combustion energy released from the fuels. Something's burning, it generates energy. And some of that's heat. Some of the heat is transferred to fuel, new fuel particles that must ignite. And if they ignite, then they start to burn and the entire process continues, right? So that's conceptually very simple. And what we need to do is break down uh, these components of this cycle and analyze them all separately. Okay, so we need to look at ignition processes for live and dead fuels. We need to be looking at <coughs> energy release and combustion here. We need to look at roles of radiation convection as principal heat transfer mechanisms that cause ignition. And only then can we finally get down to asking how fast do they work, okay? So this, this diagram, you're gonna see this um, <clears throat> a number of times throughout the talk and we'll refer to it because kind of how we organize our, uh, our research. So let's just take a look quickly at what our laboratory research uh, suggested um, uh, about roles of radiation convection and producing ignition. And fuels in wildland fires are way different than they are in, say, this building or in structure fire uh, or industrial fire settings. Uh, in wildland fire, this, this may seem uh, overly simplistic, but basically there are very fine fuels. Most of our wildlands are dominated by fine fuels that are discrete in nature, separated by gaps of air, just like my fingers on my hand. A lot of it consists of live vegetation as well. This is not present in buildings. And this structure, fine fuels separated by air, has huge implications for how heat is transferred and how the ignitions happen. Um, take a look here. This is a simple demonstration. We have a, a radiant heater, radiant heating panel. Um, we have a 12 millimeter particle here and a one millimeter. Which one do you think is gonna ignite first? Sorry, I provided the answer too quickly. But if, if this video had gone on for days and days and days, this little tiny one millimeter particle would still be sitting here without even smoking. Nothing would happen, absolutely nothing. This particle here, in about 30 seconds or so, um, could be ignited. Uh, the, the, the pyrolysate, the smoke coming off of it, it's flammable, and that, that's what the pilot light was for, okay? If you think this is surprising, then you're not alone. Fact is, most fire scientists until about a decade ago would be surprised at this. So they formulated their models, all those physical models, with the wrong assumptions about ignition and heat, tra heat transfer. Um, so if you instrument the particle, this was work done by uh, Jack Cohn, um, primarily um, instrument the particle, you put thermocouple on it, and you can see that the fine particle reaches a temperature uh, too cool for ignition. Ignition is about 350 here or something like that. The fine particle reaches this temperature and just stays there. It doesn't get any hotter, okay? Uh, I'll explain that in a second. The, the big particle heats up, gets to ignition temperature, and then uh, bursts into flame. So take a look here. Here's some Excelsior. It's, it's one millimeter shredded wood uh, on the left uh, hand panel, it's compressed into a tight ball. Same exact amount over here on the right is open. That's pretty interesting, huh? Same material, just a different level of compactness. And once again, if we'd let this video run for days and days or months or years, it'd still be sitting there. Nothing would happen. 
Okay, so the reason is that the radiant heat absorbed by the surface of these fuel particles is offset by convective cooling. The cold air surrounding these fine particles is taking the heat away as fast as it's coming in. So it never gets any hotter. So the same thing happens to you when you sit around a campfire. You know, you can ask yourself, why don't you catch on fire? Well, because if you get too hot, you back up. If you get too cold, you go forward a little bit, right? And you eventually reach a position where the amount of radiant energy coming in is the same amount of energy going out by convection and radiation. So you don't get any hotter and you're not catching on fire. Okay? These little particles, they can stand really close to a campfire and not get hot. And they do. Okay? They have a very thin boundary layer on the surface that uh, is easily disturbed by the wind or by uh, natural convection and it carries the heat away. Okay? They're just like cooling fins on engines or on CPUs. That's the reason that you have cooling fins is to facilitate convective cooling. Okay? So that's pretty interesting. If radiation isn't able to light fine fuel particles very easily, if it's not sufficient by itself, then we have to answer a couple of other questions. And, and it has to do with convection, the other heat transfer mechanism that can apply here. We can't use conduction, can we? Because conduction is through a solid. And you remember that the fuel particles are like the fingers on my hand. They're separated by air. So there's no way that conduction can occur, even if it was fast enough. It has to be by convection. So two big questions had never been answered before we started this. That is, what keeps the hot flames down in contact with the fuel? Flames are hot. They want to go up, just like a hot air balloon, right? Why would they stay down? If they don't stay down in the fuel, then they can't touch other fuel particles, OK? So they're hot. They want to go up. What keeps them down? And what is the me mechanism of forward convective heating? How could these flames allow a fire to propel itself forward? So let's, let's take a look at what we found in the laboratory. Um, first, just a little uh, graphic here. That's a candle. That's a candle on Earth. This is a candle in space um, uh, with air, but no gravity. Um, and so with gravity, what happens is it pulls down on the cold air and the dense air, right, allowing the, the lighter air to, to rise. And so that's why we get a characteristic candle shape. And um, this looks pretty steady, pretty laminar here. Um, this is all due to buoyancy. It's due to the density difference between the, the gases produced by the fire, which are about 1,000 degrees Celsius, and the air um, at about 30 degrees Celsius. So you can see from here that, <clears throat> roughly speaking, that the, that the gas density in the flame is about a quarter of the density of air, of cold air. So it rises really fast. OK, well, this one's rising very steadily. But take a look at a, a different kind of buoyant behavior here. Uh, this is a pool fire. It's just a pool of ethanol. I think it's, yeah, it's ethanol. Um, but you can use any kind of fuel you want, gasoline, um, uh, uh, isopropyl alcohol, anything, really. Um, and this is a one meter pool. And you can see these very regular patterns of puffing. It's called puffing pool fires. And uh, what happens here is that you have this puff originating at the outer rim. You can see the little kind of a bulge originating out here. And then it goes in towards the middle. Uh, the par parcel is rising. Um, and you end up getting circulations of cool air coming back down. And this is really important. You're going to see how important this is to how fires spread in a minute. So this is a simple demonstration of buoyant behavior, buoyant dynamics of a pool fire in a laboratory situation. And so you've got rising air going up. Anything that goes up, something has to come down to replace it, right? There's no way that you can have all of the hot flame going up without something coming down. And the, an analogy is taking a ball, uh, like a basketball, and pushing it underneath a swimming pool and, and then letting it go. And it, the ball is going to float to the top, right? It's going to be buoyant. It's going to bob to the top. In so doing, it's not going to leave a hole in the pool, in the water. That's going to fill in. The same way with here. The, the air, cold air, is going to fill in the volume that is, uh, is being displaced by the hot gases going up. Fair enough? OK, that's really important. What's interesting about this um, from a scaling standpoint is, is the remarkable um, uh, scaling from very, very small diameter pools all the way up to fairly large ones. Um, the frequency of that puffing, the frequency of the puffing is only dependent upon the diameter of the pool, the square root of the diameter. It doesn't depend. You can see here they've uh, plotted on this graph. Um, you can see all these different uh, fuels that they used didn't make any difference, OK? Because the combustion of, of uh, hydrocarbon fuels uh, without pre-mixing always yields about the same temperature. And thus, the gas density in the flames is always about the same. 
So it means you can study wildland fires by studying ethanol or gasoline or a lot of other things if you're only interested in the buoyant behavior. So this scaling, if you want to, the puffing of a pool fire extends from, right, tiny little few centimeter uh, diameter pools all the way up to 100 meter uh, kind of pools, which is pretty neat, pretty remarkable scaling. So take a look here. This is a, this is a crown fire. It's about a kilometer in diameter. Look at the giant billows and how regular those billows are. This is a, an example of the scaling of this buoyant behavior, this puffing at very large scales. We can see this even on larger fires than this, just don't happen to have really good video of it. But these, these giant billows are coming up. It's basically this pool fire behavior, right? You're getting rising air, getting shear coming down from the, as the cold air rushes in to kind of replace that, okay? So there's a different kind of buoyant uh, dynamic that we see when we see line fires. A lot of times you'll hear us talking about a line fire versus an area fire. A line fire is a line of fire that's advancing. And that's pretty much how we lit uh, all these burns here for our experiments. These are uh, a couple of different grass fire situations. Uh, Fort Swift, Texas, uh, Fireflux 2, Craig Clements video. I mean, some picture I got off the internet with storks eating roasted bugs. Um, and these, what you're seeing here that's so interesting is the regular pattern of these peaks, right? There's a peak and trough pattern, peak and trough pattern, okay? And, and it's very, very regular. And this is something that everybody has noticed who's watched a fire. Everybody in history probably for 300 and 400,000 years has seen this. And, and actually before we uh, started investigating this, no one really knew whether it was important or what role it might have, or whether it's just some superfluous behavior to, to, to forest fires. But the we see it in stationary fires. It doesn't have to be a spreading fire. If you have a line of fire, you'll see these peaks and troughs. You can see it in crown fires. This is up in Northwest Territories, right? Very regular pattern of these peaks in a trough. Okay, um, well, the way we came to understand this was through experiments in the laboratory. These are, this is cardboard. I'll show you a few pictures in a second. This is in our wind tunnel. Um, and we, in order to do experiments in the laboratory, what you have to do is have repeatable conditions. Repeatable wind, repeatable fuel, repeatable everything. And we have a tilting table here. It's a about four by six meter table that can tilt it up to about 45 degrees. And what we're burning on this in both these situations is cardboard. Um, we, uh, we came up with this idea because we just have never been able to repeat, uh, ensure repeatability using natural fuels, or whether it's pine needles or excelsior. You can't know that every particle is the same and you can't position every particle where you want it every single time. But by making our own fuels and lining them up at different spacings, we can ensure that we have exactly the same bed every single time. So we design these on the computer and we print them out. The, kind of a wonder of modern methods that we, we couldn't even do a decade ago, right? So we design all these. We make big ones and short ones and fat ones, and we separate them widely and make them really thin. So we basically, we call them engineered cardboard fuel beds. Um, and so this is some high-speed video taken by Ian Grobe in our wind tunnel. And you can see the same thing, peaks and troughs, right? When you look at even fires in our wind tunnel or our laboratory that are burning in different fuels, you often get not quite a clear picture of these peaks and troughs because there's little concentrations of fuel that are heterogeneous across the thing. There's different uh, factors that are not completely controlled. But with these cardboard, flame, cardboard fuels, we can get very, very uh, nice patterns that we can study. And so when we first saw this, we, we had to explain what is going on here? How, how is it that we get such regular behavior out of something as chaotic as flames? Well, uh, remember the pictures in the dynamics with the pool fire. Here it's just like a little pool fire. You have updrafts going on, and in between that and the next pool, what you have is a downdraft that has to come down and replace that. Right? So lined up along the front of the fire are a bunch of places the fire flames are going up, and, it's, and then right next to it are places where there's downdrafts. It's coming down. Okay? And when it comes down, when it comes down, what happens is it, it Blaze the fuel, displays the flame out into the fuel. This is looking down on some of our fires. And you see all these little parcels, these little concave dish-shaped parcels there. Um, 
our speculation is that these are basically Rayleigh Bernards, so the little donuts that are circulating, um, where out on the outer edges it's going up and in the inside it's going down. And then those translate through the flame zone where they splash into the fuels in front. So when you do a bunch of video analysis and, and other kinds that I'll show you, you can see that down here in the troughs where the downdraft is impinging on the flames, it's pushing those flames out forward into the fuel bed. Okay? And you notice it's not steady. It's not just a jet, like a blowtorch. It's pushing out. There are various kinds of bursts. It's not steady at all. We can look at, we can go back a little bit. And, um, yeah, so watch right out here in front. The fire is spreading from the bottom to the top. And you can see that uh, as one of these parcels moves into the it to the edge of the combustion interface, it kind of splashes flame out into the fuels. So we're starting to answer those two questions. How is it that hot flames stay down in the fuel? Well, it's because hot flames are going up someplace and they're coming down in another. And where it's coming down, the cold air is pushing the flames out into the fuel bed. And they splash forward, splash forward as these parcels exit the front of the fire. So one way of measuring this is through installing a bunch of thermocouples. And this is where we start to talk about instrumentation and, and taking laboratory instrument, instrumentation and applying it in the field. Um, we take a bunch of thermocouples and we put them in a row. And often we're dealing with 64 thermocouples separated by about three centimeters. And what we're interested in capturing is not only the bursts of these flames, these intermittent bursts, but we're interested in capturing how far they extend away from the flame zone. And so, Here's a thermocouple here that's kind of far back in the flame zone, okay? And here's a thermocouple here that's fairly far forward. And this is what, it, what the traces look like when you look at the, the temperature fluctuations. You start to see all of these little spikes, right? The flame zone is approaching it and all of these little bursts are shooting out in front and they're bathing the particles intermittently in flame. And you can see also, if you just pick one of, these, one of these spikes, you can follow it as it goes all the way up, right? So these are coherent motions in the, in, the, in the fluid. They're not just random darting flames. They actually have some coherency, and they stay coherent as they translate forward in the, into the fuels. So what we can do with this, we can break this down into pre-ignition, um, and then the burning of the fuel, and then post-fire. And what's interesting here is to estimate the frequency of these pulses. Because you remember before I was talking about buoyant dynamics from a pool fire and how the frequency scales uh, with the size of the fire. So we speculated that even in our little fires in the tunnel, we should see scaling of the frequency of these, these forward bursts if they're related to buoyancy. And with different relations you can develop from here. Here's the simplest one to interpret, but here's the intermittent frequency, the average frequency of these flame bursts, and you can see that in our, in our wind tunnel flames, they scale with flame length. So the bigger the flames have slower dynamics than the, than the uh, smaller flames, right? So if the flame length is very small, you have a higher frequency. If the flame length is uh, larger, you have a low frequency. That's kind of interesting. There's different ways to scale this. Um, here we have a, we're incorporating wind because wind is an important uh, component here. The faster the wind, the faster it moves these little parcels off, the faster it, it makes the puffing go. And so here we have what's called a Struhall fruit scaling. And I have plotted here the wind in the open dots, our wind tunnel fires, and in the, in the uh, dark uh, filled in dots, those are, the, um, those are the slope fires without any wind. And they're very similar kinds of scaling. You can't say exactly it's, it's identical. Um, so this is something we're looking for, the relationship of wind and flame size to frequency of these flame dynamics. Uh, this is another one where we're looking at um, how far, so this is the correlation distance, is how far these flame bursts go um, uh, away from the flame front. That's something else we're interested in. So, just about to wrap up the fundamentals here, but um, the question is, what happens to the fuel particles when they're bathed intermittently in flame, right? We have to know that, because if the fuel particles don't care, if they ignite and they heat up completely independently of all this interesting uh, flame behavior, then we have to look somewhere else for an explanation for how they ignite. 
And so here's a radiometer, measures the amount of radiant heat that is impinging uh, on that uh, sensor. And right in front of it is a one millimeter particle, and here's our 12 millimeter particle. And this, uh, I'm not going to play this video because it's just too dark, but basically you can take video of the flames impinging on the particles and, and on the sensor. This is some results of that. Um, that measurement or those kinds of measurements. What you're seeing is a time history here of, of various things. The red is the radiant flux. And so this is radiant flux in kilowatts per square meter. And so um, just to, for some perspective, remember I showed you the, the one millimeter and 30 millimeter, uh, 12 millimeter particles in front of uh, a radiant <coughs> panel and how the 12 millimeter particle heated up and ignited. Right? Well, that was about here at 30 kilowatts per square meter sustained. Okay, so this little fire here only reaches a peak of 30 kilowatts per square meter and then goes down. And it's only there for a few seconds. Um, so the red is the irradiance. The um, <clears throat> blue here is the air temperature. And so what you're seeing is these spikes, right? The spikes in the air temperature that, um, that we saw from the flame movements past the thermocouples. And the dark black line here is the particle surface temperature. So let's look at the last uh, 20 seconds here and what you'll see before it ignites and you'll see that the uh, whenever there's a blue spike that hits this particle the temperature goes up and then there's this intervening period where the particle starts to cool down fairly slowly and then it heats up again in a stair step and then it starts cooling down. So the particle is heating up to ignition by taking the stairs. It's not taking the escalator up. It's not a smooth uh, function of increasing temperature till it ignites. It's a stair-stepped, very, very um, episodic kind of a thing, dependent on the flame context. That's interesting. And we should see the same thing in the field. Um, the other thing we need to know here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, um, but is how long do fuels burn? What's the energy release rate? This is super important because that's like a shot clock in basketball, okay? You have the ball, you have a certain number of minute, uh, seconds before you have to shoot to take, take a shot at the basket, otherwise this fire will go out, right? The fire is burning in a given place for a certain amount of time. If it's 10 seconds, it has 10 seconds to pass on that torch, ignite new fuel particles, otherwise the fire goes out. So we're trying to verify our models, our understanding of how long fires burn and the energy release rate as well. Um, in the laboratory, we have pretty good relations between the residence time. Um, this is predicted, observed and predicted residence time based on the fuel bed packing ratio and the surface area to volume ratio. So what this means is knowing the characteristics of the fuel bed, um, moisture content obviously factors into this, you can, estimate, you can estimate how long the flames will be at a certain spot. So that's something we're interested in measuring with this instrument here. I'm just going to move past a bunch of this to get to... Um, field burns that we've uh, been doing here. So this is a image of the plot layout. And the plots that we burn, nine separate plots. One, uh, R1, two, this barley plot across the street, and then uh, DD123, EE123, and then we just messed around over here in FF. But so uh, each one of these is uh, an independent experiment. What we did is installed four types of instruments. This is from the Forest Service crew. There are other things that uh, I actually don't have very good slides for, and I'm not going to mention them. But uh, Scion installed a bunch of uh, different sensors as well. Um, what you're seeing is four, di four different kinds of instrument packages that we put into the field. Um, one is cameras, in-stand cameras. The video is super important, uh, both from outside and inside the, uh, uh, the fire. We have a pressure and flame resonance time sensor here, and that's what this package is. Then we have a radiant uh, heat flux, gas velocity, and temperature sensor. That's what this one is here. And a thermocouple array, and I didn't bring that in. It's a couple meters long. Um, so we, we installed all these out here. Uh, they're in lines. And this is from the, the UC uh, quadcopter. So these are all the cameras. And what we have to try to do is to anticipate the wind direction. So this takes uh, some skill on the part of the uh, meteorologists um, who are trying to forecast that and give us a heads up to uh, which orientation we can install the equipment. 
So this is one line of our sensors, and here's another line. That's one of the 10-meter towers from Scion out there. Okay, and then what we hope to do is have the fire spread through them um, uh, parallel to that angle. That's not always the easiest thing to do because the wind direction is flipping around. Marwan's been pretty good about giving us uh, information about which wind way it's going to go. Um, so there are the sensors there. Um, looks like we have cameras. They're in a box. It's aluminum housing with some uh, fire-resistant insulation in there. We're still kind of fiddling around with the amount of internal insulation versus external, uh, but it's just a regular old commercial Garmin camera. Um, with an external battery, it'll run for, what, about 10 hours? What's the, roughly? So the, the idea is to be able to start it up and then just have it recording while you're fiddling around with uh, getting the ignition ready. Um, with these kinds of fuels, it's pretty easy to start it up maybe just an hour before. In other kinds of fuels, you may have to get out of there hours, many hours before you actually get around to igniting. Um, this is the heat flux package. It, in this case, where the, where the uh, fuels are very low to the ground, uh, we're actually burying the, uh, the body of this thing that has all the um, electronics in it to, to protect it from the fire. Um, there's a picture of it after the fire. Um, so what you're seeing on here is a radiometer. You're seeing these little disks that are oriented um, to capture three dimensions of fluid flow, of flame or air flow past it. Um, and uh, Torben uh, Grumstrup here is the one who designed this. He can answer any questions about that. But it, we've never been able to take really good measurements of, of three-dimensional flow velocity in flames. We have to know the velocity if we're going to con calculate convective heat transfer. There's also a couple of thermocouples sitting on here so that you can understand the, the gas density past that. Um, this is what we call a pressure package, but it's got pressure, um, a pressure port. Um, this is the, there are two probes coming up here. This little uh, square box on top, aluminum box, is just to protect those probes while we're installing it. But once we're ready to burn, that's removed. There's a pressure port there to look at the hydrostatic pressure. We have a flame ionization detector there. And that only um, signals when you actually have flame contact. It's got to be flame. Uh, it can't just be hot gases or anything else. So we're trying to get a very good field estimate of the residence time. How long is the flame present at every point? Uh, we can get that also from video, but it's nice to have something uh, uh, right on the ground. We also have a thermocouple there that shows us the temperature fluctuations. Okay, so this is all housed here and buried. Um, the key to all of these instruments is this little box here. This is a data logger, and this data logger was designed and built by Kyle Wold, and uh, we made 300 of them to come over here with because normally data loggers are fairly expensive, they're fairly bulky, and you'd have to run a lot of wires to try to you know, get them into a common centralized data logger. Well, that's just not going to work with the kind of qu research questions we have here. So we specially designed these things um, to be, they're not disposable, they're maybe $100 a piece, right? But if some burn up, you just say, oh well, that's the cost of business. Um, but they're, they're really great, and they have a GPS unit on it, um, and logging at 50 hertz uh, with eight channels. So if you're interested in this thing, come take a look and you can talk to Kyle about how that's built. Um, we use these data loggers in every single instrument package we've got. So this is our thermocouple arrays being installed on some posts. They basically have a number of thermocouples sticking off of them. They're fine wire thermocouples, um, very fine, very uh, 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 easily damaged, so they're only installed at the very last minute. They can't touch any of the fuel or anything else, just the flames. And so then they're removed, and so it's kind of a delicate operation to install all those. The, the, the um, data loggers are sitting there wrapped up in foil and other insulation right there in the middle. So let's look at some videos of what we got. I wish I could show you some data, but that's, it's too premature to do that. Let's look at an in-stand video. So in this video, you can see a couple things. You can see one of our, one of our uh, thermocouple arrays. It's very similar to what we use in the laboratory. There's a heat flux package sitting around here somewhere. Um, another camera box there. These are height poles. The graduations on there are half a meter. 
just for reference. So one thing you notice immediately, look at the fire coming at us. You see the peaks and troughs in the fire? And they're waving around. I mean, there's a lot of action here. But it doesn't take very long. A gross estimate of the spread rate of these fires is about 100 meters a minute. About. We'll get much better estimates later, but if I'm going to slow it down. You just this is about a quarter speed, and you can see these bursts of flame invading the fuel bed out ahead of the what's burning, and it lights patches of fuel on fire. It's not lighting one particle at a time. You're getting these bursts that come out, and it's um, lighting entire patches on fire at once. And so you notice that once the flame goes by. Um, you can see the back end of the flame zone, right? So that's where fuels are burning out. And really, the flame is only present for about 10 seconds, 8, 10, 11 seconds on these fires. That's it. So we're very fortunate to have uh, Marwan's uh, University of Canterbury team here with drones and uh, taking videos because this gives us the really the best look at the overall fire. Um, let me back up here just a second. What you'll notice here is that we're we're igniting this field from a line, and then of course down the down the flanks. But there's a whole bunch of people that are lined up there with torches. And on the go signal, they all move laterally and ignite their segment of line. We're attempting to get a line fire that is a, a, a wide expanse of line that has very little edge effects as it approaches the sensors. Um, there's a really huge difference between the, the heat transfer in a fire that's very small versus one that's very wide. And we want this wide. Uh, to have the most generality for large wildfires. If you look down on the fire, look at the flame structure here. You, you can see a lot of those little concave parcels, those little Rayleigh Bernard circulations within the flame zone, right? It looks like there's little pockets and they're moving. Very similar to what we're seeing in the laboratory. Here the wind is turbulent, it's making it a little bit messier. <coughs> Um, but so this is as the fire is approaching our sensors. Our sensor lines are a couple places here. It's really pretty amazing to be able to do this. You know, it wasn't that long ago you'd have to use a helicopter, and that wouldn't be nearly as steady. So here's a side view of this fire coming through the sensors. Thermocouple arrays, camera boxes, everything else is down in the fuel. This fuel type, uh, granted, suggested this because it's so similar to our cardboard fuels. It's uh, really the closest you're going to get to uh, very uniform, even with all those tire tracks and everything else. It's over pretty quick. see um, oh we've been running some uh, infrared video as well this is from the ground um, the interesting thing is you can see some plume structure here so there's a lot going on up here that you just can't see because of the fire the the the, the flames themselves are intentionally um, saturated 
So we're only looking at temperature range of up to 350 C. So we're not that interested in looking at the flame structure at this for this uh, stuff. We're interested more in, in the plume and the other uh, characteristics. You're also, see, also seeing a lot of uh, solid matter being lofted. And if it was very, very dry out, so 20% humidity or 15% humidity, we might have seen some spotting from all of this um, debris that's being uh, lofted, carried downwind. This tower is a 10 meter tower. I think that's the top, uh, the top sonic anemometer. And show one more video. This is a side looking one. So that's the thermocouple array right there. That's the 30 meter tower, I think. A 10 meter, right. So these are high speed videos, 240 frames a second. You see it burning through all the plots and the, and this was uh, GM. So it was across the road in, uh, in the barley. Flames are one to two meters tall. Um, so we have broad panoramas like that, but then we've got, um, where's the little guy? Oh yeah. So this is 700 free feet frames per second. And what you're seeing here, watch these little excursions of gas. We can replay it again. As this fire is approaching the, there's one right down there. Um, see this gas, this uh, flame that's coming forward. It doesn't spend very long here. It's strafing through these fuels. And right there, it causes ignition, temporary anyway. So remember, these little fuel particles are being uh, uh, cooled by quite a bit of ambient airflow past them. It's caking the heat away as the radiation is building from the approaching front. Um, and so they're waiting. You're see, not seeing any smoke coming up from here. They're not, they're not smoking and pyrolyzing from, from all the radiant heat. Um, they're being cooled sufficiently so that they have to wait until they're bathed in this intermittent flame. So we're seeing very similar kinds of things in the field experiments here as we see in the laboratory. And these are much bigger particles. These are on the order of four millimeter diameter stalks, the vertical stuff. I'm sure there's some finer material in there, but. So I don't have that much more to say. I think, you know, we use a variety of different techniques, photographs and uh, imagery and then instrumentation in the field to capture all these things, but very much driven by our, our specific research questions as to what's going on.